it's found a treasure in a field so dolly had his love was real he bought that field and he hid it there he did so much about the world he didn't care another guy was a merchant That was his plan And when he found The one of great price Sold all he had He bought it That same night Jesus Christ The treasure, the pearl Embraces love And his word By the truth Be born again Out with the There once was a rich man and a poor Poor Lazarus waited at his door The rich man found he couldn't care at all The dogs licked his sores, Lazarus ate the crumbs that fall The truth we found was more than a well The rich man had cause now he was in hell Jesus Christ, the treasure, the pearl Embraces love and his word By the truth be born again Out with the old Jesus or Satan There's no middle ground No place to sit out You only get this life To work it Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. So glad you're here today. Today we're going to talk about a generational economic divide and conquer. I've really been noticing this as of late. Maybe you have too. And anybody that's probably over in their 30s or older can see it. You can see that the boomers are kind of doing pretty well because of the way the economic system was set up during their time versus the way it is now for the younger generations. And it's just so hard for a young couple, 35 or younger, to even buy a little starter house anymore. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and we're going to dive deep on that. And uh, we're also going to talk about inflation, how the Bible predicted inflation. Uh, We're going to talk about what Jesus had to say about money, how we can't serve God and money at the same time, and how many of us that are so caught up in the money aspects of it, of life, are on the wrong path and why when you see people that are super well to do sometimes they they seem miserable and they can't even have a normal interaction with people without getting bitter and mad and raging and upset <laughs> i've noticed that a lot with really well to do people not all not all but many 
Jesus said it'd be harder for a rich man to enter into heaven than a camel to go through the eye of the needle. The camel through the eye of the needle is on the wall of Jerusalem. There is this shape like a camel where only the camel can get through it and nothing else. And so I think that's what that expression means. But, and his apostles asked him, you know, how hardly can um, anybody enter in? And he goes, well, with, with a, Men, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. So it's not impossible for rich people to get in, but when you serve money and you put money first, as we've been taught to do in society through all of our schooling, you know, the Holy Grail, as it were, is to get the money, to get the homes, to get the, the what you perceive as safety in money. And safe harbor is not in money. It's in God. It's in keeping the commandments and serving him. And then seeking him and his righteousness. And then all these things shall be added to you. So we're going to do deep dives on all of this. And then we're going to also talk about how inflation is uh, really hurting the poor way worse than any other segment, but how the Bible talks about in revelation and also the book of Daniel about these 10 Kings that rule things from behind the scenes. And I'm just going to show you a little data that kind of shows that the elites, the super elites, the billionaires in the world they are getting a lot richer while the poor are getting much poorer and how inflation is taxation on the poor because the poor can't make ends meet. Even even the middle class, I'll show you an article today that shows that most have stopped saving, have stopped putting money in their 401ks just to try to make ends meet uh, in their lives. So we're going to cover a wide variety of topics. I'm glad everybody's here. I see Phil. Lindsay Sass, good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Gary, Simply Me, Sunita, good to see you. John Smith, child of God, glad everybody's here. But before we begin, let's do as always and pray. So Father God, we just praise you and thank you for leading us through this, these subjects which are somewhat complex and give us your simple understanding that, or an understanding that's simple enough for us to understand and to be able to bridge the gap between us and you, to not put money before you, to not worry for tomorrow as Jesus told us not to do when it comes to the things uh, that money provide provides because you are a provider. Help us through this message to find our peace in you and to not worry about um, these economic downturns and the huge amount of infl inflation that most currencies are experiencing. And I just praise you and thank you that you said in the prophecy that spoke of inflation in Revelation chapter 6, you said, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And many times I've felt led to share that I believe that represents your people. The oil and the wine is your people, the harvest of your people. So the Holy Spirit um, filled people of your that are your people that you will um, protect during this time and help us to rest on that and to not worry, be overly concerned and to set our hearts in trusting on you as children would trust and children, little children don't worry about these things. And so I praise you and thank you for leading us into this state of trusting in you, whereby no matter what we see going on around us, we can continue to, to have that trust in you and that you will be our provision, that you'll provide shelter, that food and clothing and all these things, Father, that you promise in your word. And we just give you all the praise and glory for that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. So I wrote a little bit of a teaser for tonight's show, and I said, have you noticed that the older generations were privy to better treatment by private companies in the form of pensions, retirement plans that were based on their own company's performance and their own companies would pay the pensions? So for example, in the 50s, if you worked for a company and retired, you weren't getting a 401k plan where your money's been invested in the stock or bond market or in some other uh, financial vehicle. But it was, in fact, the company that you work for that paid it. Sort of like what you see today with state state or federal employees or um, military people or um, police officers and school teachers and the like. They, they get paid, uh, well, maybe not school teachers, but the others get paid what you might call a pension. And that was the original model back in the days prior to Generation X. But when Generation X came along, all of these retirement um, options were put into these uh, what you what you could call 401k plans and they are largely invested in the stock and bond markets which are subject to market fluctuations and investor speculation so as the market goes so does your retirement and as we've seen many times before there can be some pretty dire 
days in which the markets just completely bail and you've lost everything. And um, so the boomers who worked hard for their retirements are now being ridiculed and called boomers and for having had a better situation that led them to having um, more in savings for their retirements. And they're just so much better off than the generations that have come after them. So the dollar's value during the boomers saving years was more stout and it was relatively steady, although the dollar has in decreased in value ever since it was taken off of the gold standard. Um, but these later generations, such as Generation X, the Millennials, the Zoomers, and uh, now the Alphas, um, we're just watching incredible in inflation not only chew into our purchasing power, but it's devouring the ability of these these generations coming after the boomers to save, many of whom have cashed in or eliminated savings plans in order to simply afford life. Meanwhile, the, quote, powers that be, unquote, are seeing to it that the dollar, as the world reserve oil currency, is facing the possibility that the Saudis will sell their oil with other currencies. Now, when um, President Nixon made the dollar a fiat currency in the 70s, one way he hedged the dollar was to make an agreement with Saudi Arabia that they would sell all their oil to the rest of the world using the dollar. And that's what propped up the dollar, even though the dollar was not based on anything um, material, such as gold or silver. And so now that there's the possibility of that changing, the Saudis have been talking with the Chinese and the Russians about selling their oil in the currencies of the nations who buy it. And if that happens, then the suffering that the dollar has incurred to this point will only increase dramatically and it will, it'll completely implode. The dollar will be essentially worthless or, no, or nowhere, not able to recover its value of what it once was because of the fact that there's a lot of moving parts to this, but and due to quantitative easing, which is when the Fed prints more dollars and puts it into the economy, that causes the value of each dollar that's printed to drop in value because the larger number of dollars there are circulating, the less value there is per dollar. And that's one of the issues at hand. And then you have the secondary issue being the dollar as the world reserve oil, uh, oil, oil currency of choice. And if that changes... Um, it could take the dollar's purchasing power even lower, essentially devaluing it, devaluing it into oblivion. This means that the purchasing power of the dollar could suffer an even bigger hit than from the flooding of the economy with more printed dollars that the Fed and other central banks have done at ridiculous levels in the last couple decades. Meanwhile, the rich are getting much richer and gaining access to the dollars in this so-called quantitative easing, while the poor are suffering immensely under the veiled taxation that is inflation. This is all done with a forethought as the powers that be are trying to create the right amount of chaos to have us begging for a new world currency, which they will tell us will not be subject to wild swings in value because being that there's only one currency, currency trade would end and thus val the value would be maintained unaffected by speculation that occurs when currencies are traded amongst themselves. So we'll address these economic matters here shortly, more deeply, but we're going to more importantly address why Jesus, Jesus explicitly told his followers not to serve money, but rather to seek righteousness and serve the Father, and all the things we need would be added to us. And this is in Matthew 6. We'll quote from that later. Jesus also told us not to store money where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but to make our investments in heaven by living lives obedient to the commandments. This is not our world. We are strangers and sojourners in it. This is not our economic system. But those who control it want to do one thing with it. They want to have total control and manipulation of the population in service to themselves or to destroy the useless eaters, which is everyone else but themselves, at their whim. No prophecy rings more true than the one in Revelation 13, which predicts that the beast system will require a mark either on the right hand or in the forehead, without which no one will be able to buy or sell. It is our dependence on this system that must be broken so that we may fully depend on the Father and live outside of their manipulation because all who take the mark will be unredeemable after without any access to salvation. 
And so that's what we have to learn through this process is to continuously figure out ways to limit our exposure to this worldly government system and begin to trust the father to lead us into ways to receive his provision outside of this economy. Because the more we're tied into it, whether it's through access to food, their medical world, which I I've said many times before, I would not go anywhere and touch them with a 10 foot pole when their, when their symbol has two serpents wrapped around a staff, you know, something's wrong. Start praying to God for healing and seeking him as for natural means for healing. And this is my advice. And we can go to great depths talking about that too. But the point I'm trying to, to, to say is that if you don't have access to their economy, you can't buy or sell without the mark. Or if you don't do what they say, as we experienced the last couple of years, they try to limit your access to jobs, limit your access to the economy, try to say you can't take a flight or travel abroad or work at a certain company or go to a certain school because you won't take their thing. Then we've got to seriously start to consider praying very deeply about how God is going to, con to separate us from that and provide for us as he did for the Hebrews in the wilderness when they left Egypt and they didn't have water and they didn't have any food. And then he provided manna from heaven and quail blew in on the, on the East wind and he provided for them water from a rock. And it is literally going to have to get to that point with us as revelation. I want to say it's chapter 11 shows when the metaphorical woman is hidden by the father in the wilderness for a time, time and half of the half of times, which is three and a half years, which I believe to be the latter half of the tribulation where we're going to be protected of God in the wilderness, just like the Hebrew people were. And we are going to have to really start praying about and seeking God for what that means uh, for us, for each one of us, um, either together, uh, either alone or in a corporate way. You know, some people might be alone like Noah was with his uh, three sons and their wives and his wife, or like Lot when he ran out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Others still might be in small groups of 20 or 30 or 40. Who knows how it's going to turn out? But we have to, as a people, start trusting God so much that whatever goes on in the economy isn't going to affect us so harshly because we've already begun to separate ourselves because we don't want any part of their world. We don't want to be controlled by their medical world. We don't want to be controlled by their tech people that try to control the medical world. And you know who I'm talking about. These people that literally serve Satan, they cannot be our masters and we cannot be slaves to money. We cannot be a servant to money. We can only serve one master. And I'm actually going to go to the scriptures first before I dive deep on this other stuff I'd planned. So what did Jesus teach about money? I mean, if you think about this, some of you might think this sounds more like what a hippie from the sixties might say, you know, the ones that just sold everything and wouldn't use money and just filmed rides across the U S and did a lot of weed and drugs and stuff. And, uh, they may have had certain parts of this model to them. And obviously they were really messed up serving demons and drugs and whatnot. But I want you to really look at this scripture from Matthew six with new eyes and think about what he's really saying and how much of a departure it is from what we might be accustomed to. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. So I, just real quickly want to show you the average um, boomer has um, $1.7 million in assets. That's real estate, corporate stocks and mutual funds, retirement funds, private businesses and other assets. So they built that up over time and they're, re they're relying on that for their retirement. 1.7 million. Do you think that every Christian boomer that has that much money has adhered to this lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is there will your heart be also so it's no wonder he told the apostles that it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and 
if um, such is the case, if we've got a bunch of stuff stored up in this life, nearly $2 million worth, does, did we at some point cross some line? Is that what Jesus intended for this model that we were all taught from college, from high school forward that you need to save up and, and, and put your money away so that you've got at least a million dollars for retirement? I was told that day one of my first job. We, our first job, one of the benefits was a financial planner came and talked to you and showed you that if you start now at age 22, you will have this many millions by the time you retire based on just a normal um, raise, uh, raise, you know, normal raise calculations over the years and you making investments at 6% annual um, returns, that sort of thing. And you say, well, you'll have $2 million by the time you retire if you do it at that rate. And that seems that seems from a worldly perspective wise, but Jesus is not talking like that. He's not telling those people, okay, you need to lay apart this much. He said, he prayed, he told people to pray, give us this day our daily bread. That's what he told them. And then when Israel was in the desert, God only gave them enough manna for a single day, unless it was Friday when he gave them two days worth, so they wouldn't have to pick it up on the Sabbath. Do you see how we've been taught completely the opposite of the scriptures when it comes to money? And even people like Dave Ramsey teach the world way, and he calls himself a Christian. I'm telling you, Dave Ramsey telling you to get out of debt? Dude, wise, wise counsel. But him trying to make a bunch of millionaires? That's not what Jesus taught. And Jesus, God the Father, is the provider. Turo says, Jesus sent the apostles out, no food or provision. Now that's faith and obedience. Yeah, when they came back, he asked them, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. And I will attest to the Father being so faithful to that. I, I tell you what, I'm not getting any skinnier. Um, well, I'm trying to at least. <laughs> he goes, um... He goes on, uh, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. So he's saying, if you're not focused on money, you will be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. So he's saying, if, if you serve mammon, then you are going to be full of darkness. And what kind of instigated me doing this podcast tonight, I've been thinking about this for about a week or so since I got back from... My brother took me up to the mountains and I just saw a lot of retired boomers and man, they look, they look like this. Let me show you what they look like. They were so clean cut. They look like they were living the dream. They were, I mean, I don't even know like the upscale brands of clothing, but they looked so, they just looked wealthy. They look like these people. They looked extremely wealthy. I mean, they had, everything was all together, well quaffed. Um, they were just living the dream of being a, a, a consumer with, with no worries seemingly, but I didn't see any of them smiling like these people for this picture. These are models here, but I didn't see them smiling or interacting very much. I just, I saw a lot of sort of sour looks on their face. And I wonder, I wondered if the problem was they got to there, they, they got the brass ring, the Holy grail, whatever. They saved enough money to have a house in South Florida, in, in, in Naples or somewhere on West Palm beach. And they got a house up in the mountains. They've got what everybody said should make them happy. And did it make them happy? Why, why are they soured up like a prune in their face? Why are they not happy? Why do I see people that have very little joking around and, and having laughs and these people that supposedly did everything just right, weren't happy. Well, that's because what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? How many, to be able to afford that lifestyle that these people had, how many compromises had they had, did they have to make to get to that point? How many times did they do something that was unsavory or untoward or hurt somebody in order to, to achieve their dream of saving that much money? And, you know, I'm 52 now and I've, seen a lot of things and, and worked in a world that was, although I was not affluent, I was around affluent people all the time. And I saw it over and over and over again, that money is not going to satisfy. 
What will satisfy is if you do this. Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose it, his life for my sake shall find it. Wait, what did he just say? So if I don't make, if I make it about Jesus and not about myself and I give up what I want, I'm going to find my life. You're going to find the life that was Eden before the fall where everything was provided for you. Like Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be provided for you. It's not you having to run on this slave hamster wheel until you're 65 or 70 now or even older just so you can get to take a break finally when your body's breaking down. God will provide for you like a little child the whole way along if you'll just trust in him and do things his way and not to have a competition with the Joneses and learn to be content with less. More and more stuff never contents a person like more and more of the Father and the Son living their life to the fullest in you. Nothing can compare to that. Jesus goes on, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So you get all this money by compromising and sinning and hurting other people sometimes, putting other people in usury and debt. I mean... Just think about how many, how many times do companies provide credit and debt to get people to spend more than they would have otherwise, whether you're selling a car or a house or consumer items like at Walmart or whatever, and they take these credit cards and people just go deeper into debt. Do you think that's going to uh, bode well at your, at the white throne judgment for those people that do th do that? I don't think so. I think there's going to be a lot of hell to pay for people that don't repent for that. And anybody that's watching that did achieve some level of wealth, you can repent at any point. Just like the man who repented, uh, who was the tax collector who repented, Zacchaeus. And he restored fourfold what he had taken from people wrongfully. And Jesus said that salvation was brought this day to his house. So it's not too late to lose your life to save it. But what the problem is, is that when many people decide they're going to meet with the father, they consider like the rich young ruler, what they might have to give up. And Jesus asked him to sell all that he had and give to the poor and come follow him. Jesus didn't ask that of everybody, but he asked it of him. Why? Because he knew he was covetous. And for many of you, you are just like that rich young ruler. You are considering serving the father and you've, you feel insulated and you feel protected. Like the church, church goers at Laodicea, they thought they were rich and had need of nothing. And yet Jesus told them they were naked and poor and dirty and filthy and blind and naked. He told them that, that what they perceived was their protection was not. And Jesus told us many, he told us that, He's going to the father's uh, to the father's house. There's many mansions to prepare a place for us. This is not our world. That we are all of his servants are kings and priests. We are multi cajillionaires in the heavenly realm in the world to come, but in this world we're not. And that doesn't mean that some of us haven't been given some provision for God's purposes. But that doesn't mean. Uh, that if we're poor, that doesn't mean that we've done something wrong. One of the two churches that he speaks to in Revelation before the second coming, he tells them that, yeah, you don't have any money, but you're rich. Do you see what I'm saying? Like some of us are allowed to be really poor for a reason, but we learn to trust in the father poor. When I say poor, poor as perceived by the world, but we're rich in the father and his provision comes to us daily, even though we don't have storehouses full of stuff to give us this perceived feeling of safety that isn't really safety because even those things we could lose at any moment. This inflation that's going on that the Bible predicts in Revelation chapter six, I mean, lots of people's storehouses of money are lo it's losing every single day. It's losing more and more value. It's got less 
value to it. It's a fiat currency. It's not based on gold or silver or anything. It's based on its perceived value. And again, and we're going to address this in a minute, they're making order out of chaos. They're going to create the chaos, and that is devalue the currencies. And I think they're going to allow the Saudis to use other currencies uh, as a petro petro currencies. And when that happens, who knows what's going to happen to that dollar. It's going to, I think it's going to be pretty much useless. At least that's what they're predicting. And we'll read some articles about that. Jesus goes on about money. He says, no man can serve two masters for either. He will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now look how he's like telling you to be like a little child and not worry at all. He says, therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not bet much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Raiment's clothing. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you uh, that they are more glorious than even Solomon in all of his glory. I, I lost that scripture. What did I do with that? Basically, that's what he says to him. I don't know why I don't have that scripture on the page. That's what, they, what he said, that these lilies are more glorious than Solomon in all of his glory. So he's telling you, you're not even supposed to worry about these things. You know, I'm not trying to brag, but praise God, I was able to get into this mode. And I had so much clothes just given to me out of nowhere. Or I'd walk into like a thrift store recently and I got a pair of khakis that were, I think I paid six bucks for them. They're practically brand new. They, they look like $80 khakis. And I'm not trying to brag. It's not about me, but it's about how I'm trying to tell you that he keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. And he'll provide you what you need when you need it. And you've got to get used to that. It's only going to get worse as far as this world goes in terms of inflation and the dollar and these things go into pots. So I am missing a scripture. Let me see if I can find it. I want to read the rest of chapter six of um, Matthew. Let me pull it up real quick. And trying to get to the to the scripture says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And that's what continues on in Matthew 6. So let me get it, get it on the screen for you real quick. Okay. Okay, so this is where exactly where we're reading from before. He says, um, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, ye, ye of little faith? Or do you have to be like the Joneses and wear all the most expensive stuff and pay full price for everything? just so you could be competing with others. He says, therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed for after all these things do the Gentiles seek for your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of all these things. The Gentiles seek, the unbelievers seek, the pagans seek after these things. They worry about these things because their God is not to be trusted, but our God is to be trusted. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. It's deep, but it's easy to understand if you let yourself understand it. If you let yourself understand that you can't serve both God and money, and if you have done that, that you actually need to repent. You need to repent. 
Well, let's go on now to talk about the prophecies with regard to the end times and the seals that were broken. There were four of those seals broken. And the first one had to do with a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. A crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And um, when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. I've talked about this in another podcast, but what this means, a measure of wheat for a penny, is it describes the direness of these circumstances. A penny represented a full day's wages for one man, enough for one meal of wheat bread or three meals of barley. So, you know, we think of a penny as being pretty much worthless in, in our day, but this is talking about a, a, a mode of currency that would pay for a, a day's wages would be a penny. And so it's basically saying like you can work all day and only afford a loaf of bread. That's pretty much what it's saying. And if that's what we're coming to, but it goes back here and it also says, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And I've shown you guys from the scripture how the harvest of the grapes represents God's people and wine represents part of the harvest. The oil also represents the Holy Spirit. So the spirit filled believers He's saying, don't hurt them, especially at the beginning of the tribulation when our job is to preach the gospel, those of us that are walking in the truth. So even though I'm trying to to make you feel confident that even though this is going to go on as as it's been prophesied, you should still be confident and that that you are going to be okay. You know, things might not be the same as what you might have been used to in decades past, but you're still going to be all right. You're not going to be hurt. And again, you're one of the things about going through this is learning to be grateful every day to the father in spite of the fact that you're not, quote, enjoying the same levels of provision or or getting the same levels of material wealth as you once did. And you got to stop basing your joy, your peace and your happiness on your material wealth. So what is inflation? Inflation is a rise in prices, which can be translated as the decline of purchasing power over time. So you can see here that in 1975, uh, 25 cents would buy you a cup of coffee, just drip coffee. We're not talking about expensive espressos and cappuccinos and frappuccinos and all that. So you can buy just a, a cup of drip coffee for a quarter in 1970. 2022, that was like $1.85. Usually it's over two bucks now. And it's just a standard coffee shop. So you can also think of it in a reversed way. So if you have a dollar in 2020 and you go back to 1920, that one dollar would have basically bought you $26 worth of goods in 1920. So a 2020 dollar, a hundred year prior would have been worth $26 and 14 cents. And it made a precipitous uh, drop in the early twenties and started to make a comeback to um, 19 about right around 20 bucks in 1933 or so and then it's steadily declined ever since and um, you can kind of see I I want to say that the first um, releasing of gold as the backup for the dollar started in the mid-teens when the Federal Reserve began to take over And then definitely by the time of Nixon, it was fully released from having any gold as um, being being held in reserve for every dollar that stopped. And you can see how worthless the dollar is because of that. That's what you call fiat currency. So there are several ways that inflation comes about. And there's three categories for that that these economists have come up with. So there's demand pull. This is when demand for goods or services exceeds production capacity. So let's say they're building iPhones and they 100,000 people want to buy iPhones, but only 50,000 are made. The value of the iPhone is going to go up because there's there's not that much in supply available and that will drive prices up. Another way is cost push. So when production costs increase, 
let's use the iPhone again as an example and different elements of the iPhone, like the battery and the circuits and all of those things that make, and the computer chips and all of those things, if those prices go up, then that's going to cause the price of the iPhone to go up. And also there are built in, um, variables that affect inflation, such as when wages rise in order to maintain living costs, when you may manufacture a product, you have to factor in that you have to pay your people more and you're going to have to charge more for your product in order to pay your people more. So it becomes kind of a, a cycle, a vicious cycle. And you can see how the dollar itself through inflation since, um, just since 2007, look how it's just plummeted. Now the dollar did go up and back up in 2008, but that's when um, the bubble burst over the real estate market and people lost a lot of money. And so the value of the dollar went back up because prices had to drop because people weren't willing to pay the same money they were paying for items prior to the real estate crash of 2008. But ever since then, it's continuously uh, dropped. Now there's another kind of inflation is I call it, I'm just going to call it geographic inflation. And that's when you go into different parts of a nation and find that things are way more expensive there than in other parts of the country. So you can see on this chart that shows the U S that less valuable, uh, where, where the dollar is the least valuable. That is, it takes more dollars to buy less things, uh, less product, less, less real estate, less homes, less whatever is where you see in the red. So the most expensive places in America, you can see in the San Francisco region over on the West coast. Then you can look around DC where all the money is paid to the lobbyists and whatnot to, um, pay off all those corrupt politicians. And also in the New York city region and area, the tri-state area up, up there. And so you can also see, how the teal, the darkest teal blue is where it's cheapest to live. So you could see parts of Alabama, the Southeast parts of South Carolina, um, have the most of that color. I see that, um, Arizona has a pretty good amount of it and it's on its Eastern border with New Mexico. But anyway, you could see the various parts of the country are more expensive to live in than others. And that's, if you're traveling, that is a type of inflation on, on you as well. And you can see how between, in part due to COVID, that after 2021 through 2023, huge spikes in infl inflation. And so CPI is the number that you hear on the news the most, the Consumer Price Index. And that jumped up to 9% in 2022. And now all of these different uh, ways to measure inflation seem to be making a do nosedive right now. And you'll see if you go in the store, the eggs cost a lot less than they did six months ago. And there, you know, there is, has been some recovery on that, but still you wonder when the other shoe's going to drop. There's so many things um, going wrong with regard to this inflation that the Bible predicted. So let me take you over to some of these articles about inflation and what they're saying has been some of the fruit of it. And this article talks about how Retirement savings is being battered by inflation, and this is because people can't afford to save money anymore. So the boomers have already saved, and now they're spending what they've saved. But the Gen Xers and the younger ones that are trying to save are having a much harder time doing so. So let me get Safari up. Here we go. So inflation battered retirement savings in 2022 story by Breck Dumas. And this is from Fox business it says, according to new data, a year of surging prices for everyday expenses, squeezed Americans budgets to the point of kneecapping an alarming number of us households, retirement savings in 2022, the TIAA Institute and George Washington university's global financial literacy, excellence center. That name's too long. Latest personal finance index 
released last week found historically high inflation forced a quarter of Americans to slash their retirement savings and a full 12% to quit saving entirely over the last year, concerning researchers. This steep of drop on top of a crisis where 40% of Americans already don't have enough save for retirement, according to them, means many families will have to work even harder to achieve a secure retirement. So that just shows you that's one of the impacts of inflation. Um, this t uh, article is entitled Dollar Weakens After U.S. Job day Jobs Day Suggests Slower Rate Hike Path. This is on U.S. News and World Report. The dollar weakened on Friday after U.S. labor data for February showed slower wage growth, suggesting an easing of inflation pressures may keep the Federal Reserve's pace of interest rate hikes modest and thereby reduce the greenback's appeal. So what's happening, what that's saying is that people are not making more money. Just because there's inflation does not mean that their um, salaries and their wages are being inflated commensurate with inflation. And there's always a big lag on that. Now, normal people's incomes aren't increasing, but CEOs incomes are increasing dramatically during this time. The really rich are getting much richer. There are some CEOs that make 5,000 times more than their average employee. Now I'm going to show you some of that data in a second. All right. So what are some of the other reasons and I addressed this earlier in the introduction has to do with the dollar um, no longer being the world reserve currency for trade of oil. So this is actually written by Ron Paul and it's on CNS news. It says, will the end of the petrodollar end the U S empire it says future historians may say that the most significant event of 2023 had nothing to do with Donald Trump, other 2024 presidential candidates or even war in Ukraine. Instead, the event with the most long-term significance may be one that received little attention in the mainstream media. Saudi Arabia's movement toward accepting currencies other than the U.S. dollar for oil payments. After President Nixon severed the last link between the dollar and gold, his administration negotiated a deal with the Saudi government. The U.S. would support the Saudi regime, including by providing weapons. In exchange, the Saudis would conduct all oil transactions in dollars. The Saudis also agreed to use surplus dollars they accumulated to purchase U.S. Treasury bonds. The resulting petrodollar is a major reason why the dollar has maintained its world reserve currency status. Also this year, China and Brazil made an agreement to conduct future trade between the countries using the country's own currency rather than dollars. Brazilian President Lula da Silva has called on more nations to abandon the dollar. This de-dollarization movement is driven in part by resentment of America's foreign policy, including, in particular, the U.S. government's increasing use of economic sanctions. Dethroning the dollar from its world reserve currency status makes it easier for countries to ignore these sanctions. De-dollarization will negatively impact the U.S. government's ability to manage its over $30 trillion of debt. Which, by the way, most of that is to the Fed because every time the Fed prints a dollar, we owe them a dollar. We give them a bond for a dollar, saying we owe them a dollar for every dollar they print. So the central bank, which is not federal, it is a private bank, prints the dollars and then we owe them money for printing our dollars. And that's why many presidents of the past, including Andrew Jackson, and it's even said that Abraham Lincoln fought there being a central bank for this very reason. But moving on, um, de-dollarization will negatively impact the U.S. government's ability to manage over $30 trillion in debt. With a few exceptions, there is no, still no real support in Congress for spending cuts. Republican leadership members say they will not support a debt ceiling increase unless it is tied to spending cuts. However, after the Biden, Biden administration accused Republicans wanting to cut Social Security and Medicare, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy declared a reduction in spending on Social Security and Medicare, big drivers for the federal deficit, off the table. Similarly, despite the growing skepticism of foreign interventionism among Republicans, the military-industrial complex maintains a vice-like grip on congressional leadership in the White House. This is no surprise. They're all run by the powers that be as we keep referring to them. So it's just going on and talking about how we're being controlled and it's true. And, um, the fact that we have a 
welfare warfare fiat currency system he as ron paul is saying here could lead to an economic meltdown worse than the great depression well the bible says it's going to be that way if indeed we are on the end times a measure of wheat for a penny means you can every one a day's wages normal day's wages will only buy a loaf of bread so the inflation that we're suffering right now is actually nowhere really nowhere near that stage yet where people will go work and make 15 20 dollars an hour and work all day and uh have what a hundred bucks and pay a hundred dollars for a loaf of bread we're not there yet we're not there yet now you know they say dollar 90 a day in the rest of the world outside of these western countries is enough a dollar 90 in u.s currency is enough for a person to be able to feed himself so other than in these really super affluent areas of the world and and in the rest of the world the third world a dollar 90 will actually allow you to to live as you're still in poverty but that's a lot less than it would take in most U.S. cities or most Western cities or in Dubai or in Hong Kong or anywhere else. So you can see here, here's another story about Saudi Arabia mulling oil sales in the Chinese, using the Chinese yuan. And uh, this is on Axios and written by Matt Phillips. And let's see if it's got a date on it, March 18th of last year. So this has been going on. This is a whole year and a month later. The crunch, crushing sanctions levied on Russia by the U.S. showed the power of the dollar, and that may drive efforts to avoid using the greenback. Case in point, Saudi Arabia is in talks with China about accepting Chinese currency in exchange for oil, the Wall Street Journal reports. Why this matters? Such a deal could signal that the dollar's preeminent status, already in flux as a result of China's rise, faces additional challenges during the, the moment of geopolitical change. This moment of geopolitical change. What is the threat level? Experts on the dollar, which is the world's dominant currency in terms of pricing payments and reserves, say the potential Saudi-China oil linkage is more a symbolic move than a serious threat to the dollar's top dog reserves currency. Well, things have changed since then with the adding of BRICS, which is Brazil, um, India, China, South Africa, and, um, and Russia. So if all of those stop using the dollar and all of those are huge traders of energy, then what's going to happen? It could get really bad. So, and obviously they were talking about this over a year ago. And I think when the media does this, they're warning us in advance. They have to tell us in advance what's going to happen. And so it has happened. All right, let's get our keynote back up. And, and I kind of want to switch gears. I'm going to return in a minute back to the wage gap between CEOs and the super rich and the elite and how the poor are getting poorer. But I kind of skipped over what I wanted to talk about in terms of the divide and conquer routine that's being run on us with regard to the different generations. And, you know, you hear that word boomer being used as a pejorative a lot lately in a derogatory way. And, you know, boomers are irritating to the younger generation. You can see here on the thumbnail that I, I found this, um, this photo that has these two older retirees sitting on a, on a pile of cash and the young couple that looks to be between 30 and 35 looking at an empty wallet. And um, we talked about some of the reasons for that. But as we go into this topic, I want to show you where the generations are said. This is how they're kind of been defined in modern par parlance. So from n prior to the 1928, those birthed before then, which there aren't many left of, of those, they were the, called the greatest generation. Then 1928 to around 1945, that was called the silent or the traditional generation. Then you've got in 1946, that's when the boomers began to be born. And that's a pretty long period all the way to 1965. So it's about a 20 year period when boomers were being born. Now, for some reason, Generation X, which I have titled here in orange, the Xers, they're from 1965 to around 1977, 1976. It's only about a 10, 11 year period. And then they began to entitle them millennials between 1977 and 1996. That's when they would have been born. And um, the Zoomers, would are the, the Generation Z as they're called, and some call them Zoomers. They're from 1996 to 2011. 
and those born after 2011 to now is called the alpha generation, which I find interesting. And, you know, there's all of this talk of the age of Aquarius and of the beast and the Antichrist. So that would be interesting that they would entitle this the alpha generation. And will that be the generation that sees the Antichrist come, come along? Personally, I would think so. Um, but that's, as we talk about these gen different generations, that's how they're um, defined. So I should have kept the colors the same in this chart, but I want to show you a percent of population. So the silent generation, there's only about 5% of the population is them. So the ones born between 1928 and 1945, you know, they're, they're beginning to pass on. 21% of the population is represented by boomers. Again, they're from 46 to 65, roughly. 19% of the population are the generation X, 65 to 76. 21% of the population are millennials, born 1977 to 1995. 20% of the population Zoomers, and 14% alphas. So you can kind of see how it's broken down. So it's pretty, it's pretty even, roughly around 20% for... Uh, boomers, Xers, millennials, and Zoomers. And then um, alphas haven't had um, as much time to, to build up population. But as far as the U.S. goes, um, people are having far fewer children. But the reason why that number in the alphas is probably propped up is because of all the immigration. There's a lot of children being brought from um, by breaching the southern border into the U.S. And they're, I believe they're using them in the census data. So who's got all the money? Um, this article says, which generation has the most wealth? It says baby boomers have the highest net worth averaging $1.6 million per household. So that means there's a lot of people that are way above that number and many people that are below that number, but they're saying that's the average, the silent generation, again, born before 1945, um, they, they're said to have 1.2 mil per household baby boom. And this includes the value of the homes, all their real estate, everything. Baby boomers, 1.6, Gen X, 1.1, and the millennials haven't had as much time to build up a savings and how hard will it be for them to do so uh, because of all the inflation they've incurred and all of the uh, market downturns they've, they've incurred and just the, the nature of the economy compared to when the prior generations were around has uh, not been too great. Um so who has the most assets? Baby boomers also have the most assets per household, followed by the silent generation, generation X and millennials. As for asset components, baby boomers have the most in retirement savings as many people of the generation have not yet retired or been retired for very long. They also have slightly more than the silent generation in stocks and real estate. Generation X and millennial, millennials are starting to build their wealth. Millennials in particular have little wealth in stocks and mutual funds averaging around 18,000 per household. Many also do not own real estate an asset area traditionally used to build wealth because they can't buy real estate because of the fact that the boomers, especially here in the Southeast, the boomers in the North who had big money, sold their homes for big money. They moved South. They drove prices up uh, cities like Charlotte, where I once lived, where you could buy a little ranch house for 150 grand. That would be three to 400 grand now. And I know I've some anecdotal, evidence of younger people between 25 and 35 that normally would have owned houses by now that are combined income making more than a hundred grand. They can't afford it. They can't buy a house. Their monthly payments would be 25 to $3,500 and um, all the other costs associated with that. They can't afford it. So they pay rents upwards of $2,000 and paying rent for 2000 and you get no value back out of it. It's not an investment. It's just pouring your money down the toilet. So this generation is under severe attack. And, um, I think it's all been planned and on purpose again, bringing order out of chaos. They want to ruin us economically. So, and they're going to cause the problem and then they'll bring the solution, a one world government, a one world currency with whose value they'll say cannot fluctuate, but with a one world currency where you can't buy or sell without the mark, or it's all a digital currency, even before the mark. And it's like a Fed coin, like a cryptocurrency. They could, but using uh, computers, just decide that you can't have that money anymore. It's not in your pocket. It's not an object. It's not gold. It's not silver. It's not coinage. It's not paper dollars. It's not in your pocket anymore. It's in a place that's been centralized and they can control it. 
And I know many of you watching that know about cryptos will say, well, that's the opposite of Bitcoin. Bitcoin ran on servers at people's homes and, you know, you've got your password and they can't come get your money without that password. Well, all of that, I believe, look how much crypto, look how much Bitcoin fluctuated in the last two years, how it just basically uh, just bombed. I think they're going to bomb that world and then they're going to introduce their own global cryptocurrency eventually. It has to happen that way. There's no other way for it to happen. There has to be a one world currency that you, you can't buy or sell without this mark. Sorry, I showed you that, showed you that. And there you can see a chart that shows the, how the, the numbers broken out for um, the baby boomers and silent generation Gen X and all that. So the boomers um, have 37% of all assets, uh, silent, the silent generation still has 29, the Xers have 27 and the millennials only have 7% just to show you how that breaks out. Now, the one thing I mentioned earlier, I want to remind you of is that generation X was the first generation that all retirement based, uh, uh, products were no longer pensions, but they were based on 401ks. Um, unless you work for the government sector or, you know, or police officer or, or, or whatnot, then you can still have, get pensions. But in the private sector, it became all based on 401ks and IRAs and the like. So this means their wealth is dependent on the markets rather than on the performance of just one company, the one they actually worked for, the one they were supposed to trust. And you'll notice that over the years, since the boomers and the silent generation were working, You'd join one company right out of school and you'd probably stay with that company for 20, 30, 40 years. And obviously it's so different now. Everyone's a free agent. I think part of the reason they did that was to create disunity among families, to break families apart. So corporations began to hire people in one region, give them a opportunity for a raise or an opportunity for a promotion, move them to another part of the country and split families apart. So families would be divided and conquered that way. I mean, my own family, my, my dad's uh, sisters and, um, and him, you know, and their children, none of us live in the same space. What if we had all grown up together and supported one another? You know, as long as there's unity, there's strength in numbers. Now, disunity will obviously bring a bad result to that too, but I still think that what the corporations have done was planned in terms of how to use a person's desire for promotion, a desire for money, their greed and their ego to cause them to separate from that which would have made them stronger. And that's a typical narcissistic uh, tactic is to divide and conquer any group that would be stronger in, in numbers. And so they've separated us and they've used money to do that. Now I talked about how they're trying to divide and conquer us, not only by race and by sexuality and by every other thing, but they also are creating narratives where, um, one generation is going to resent another. So here's an article written way back in 2017 on New York post by Pamela Kripke. It's entitled, here's another way baby boomers are screwing the rest of us. So here we are creating a divine uh, conquer routine with this article, which I'll go show you the beginning of it. But the thing I pulled from it, which was to my point about Gen Xers no longer having pensions. Um, she writes in this article, while, while Gen Xers parents had generous pensions, Gen Xers are rapidly seeing rich employment benefits diminish. There's been a scraping away of middle management and benefit plans. They'll be the first generation, at least in the private sector, that's completely 401k, says Farrell. Plus, they are squeezed with having children later and parents who live into their 80s. Gen Xers will ask, do my parents move in with us? Can we afford assisted living? Do I have to build a ramp to the front door? They're dealing with a lot of the pressures that have been accumulated because of the restructuring of the economy over the last 30 years. And it really has, has not been good for any of the post-boomer generation. So a lot of people... They'll write an article like this that's set up to resent the boomers, but the boomers didn't do anything but allow themselves to be alive during the time where companies actually treated their employees fairly. And that's all gone out the window. And 
can't wait to show you the extravagant differences between what CEOs make and what a regular employee makes. So let me go to this article, the New York Post article real quick. Where did you go? Hmm. Oh, here we go. Sorry, they have the, they have horrible ads on this this thing. It's hard to make a move. So it's uh, let me go down a little lower. The article itself is talking about how boomers will have to be cautious with their their savings because they're living longer. A medical costs have risen. They're not, um, they have to really think about what they're going to leave their offspring in terms of inheritance. And they're less likely to volunteer to their offspring how much they plan to give because they don't know how much, you know, they might live a lot longer. They might not be able to give as much. But about 75 million boomers, those born between 46 and 64, are alive and well in America, comprising the nation's second largest age demographic, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, just behind millennials. Because the youngest boomers are in their early 50s and the oldest just reaching 70, they represent a wide swath of lifestyles. The youngest could have high school kids, while the oldest could have 40-something children, plus grandchildren, even great-grandchildren. As any with any group at any time, some have a lot of money and some don't, determining what kind of inheritance, if any, they will transfer to their kids. In total, though, boomers are the nation's wealthiest ever generation, with a 50.2% share of net household wealth projected for 2020, according to a 2015 Deloitte Consulting study. Almost 20% have investable assets of about 500,000. 37% have about 50,000 in liquid cash, the study says. What set boomers apart from their age mates in the past is their longevity and expected 78 to 92 for women and 76 to 89 for men, says the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. Citing the ranges as a function of wealth, their increased lifespan creates a financial puzzle. They have more time to work, earn money and enjoy life, spend money while also incurring health care costs and other expenses. It used to be anyone who was 66 was the same as someone who was 86, according to the census. Now, someone who is 66 is not young, but he's not old either. The period is not a transition anymore to old age, but rather a new stage of adulthood. By 2029, when the youngest in the boomer age bracket turns 65, the U.S. Census Bureau predicts more than 61 million boomers will still make up about 17.2% of the population. So they're asking, will my money extend to the number of years I'm going to be living? This is different from what the previous generations were asking. So it's just, it, the article really has nothing to do with the title, which says, here's another way baby boomers are screwing the rest of us. And it's not true um, that they're screwing the rest of us. What's screwing the rest of us is the way that the economic powers that be in the corporations are not providing the same kind of benefits to their employees as they did before. Now, before I leave this page, I don't know if you guys can see this, but it says uh, up above, one of the articles is called, I'm, proud, I'm a proud Christian porn star. God put me on earth, on earth to, uh, I don't know, to enjoy uh, probably her sexuality. I'm not going to even click in there. But it just shows you how the main the media is promoting the idea that someone so filthy as her could actually be a Christian. That's not a Christian. That's a Satanist. And um, that's obviously quite obvious. But anyway, that was just a little sidetrack. But getting back onto this, um, this is just an example of creating the animosity between the generations. And it's pretty hardcore. Okay, so let's move on in our presentation. One thing about Generation X, so you can see again, this is kind of our line of demarcation between live, having an economy where the P 
people in the economy can actually save money to have an economy where the generations following the boomers couldn't save money. So it says in this article, Generation X has fewer assets than boomers and the silent generation, and they have also the highest average liabilities. Liabilities are debts. Generation X households have an average of $146,000 in unpaid mortgages. So during Generation X, that's when house values exploded because you're always going to pay more for something when you use debt than what you would use if you were to pull cash out of your pocket and buy it. So house values are exploding extravagantly huge now way above what they'd really be worth in terms of the timber and the materials used to build the house. And now we're overpaying for things so dramatically because we're willing to use debt and generation X fell into this. And I have a business degree from a small liberal arts school and they taught me that leverage meant strength and having leverage, meaning your credit score, your ability to borrow that gives you strength as a person or as a company. And that was the biggest lie ever foisted on business school graduates, MBAers and the like that think that debt is good. Debt is not good. The Bible says debtor, the debtor is slave servant to the lender. That is because when you borrow the time that you use to make the money to pay off your debts is being given over to the person you're in debt to that makes you their slave. So, the type of slavery we have now versus the, 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 the slavery that was experienced in Egypt or the slavery um, through the slavery of the 17th and 18th centuries uh, is different only in the sense that there are, physical, there are physical chains on them. But if you allow yourself to go into debt, the bank or whoever you borrowed the money from becomes your controller because all that you do with your energies going forward is pointed in their direction to pay them back. And so when we over borrow to buy these giant homes that we don't need, we put ourselves in bondage and the root word for mortgage comes from the word mort, which is also used in mortuary. Um, it means until death. So, you know, you sign a 30 year note. Uh, yeah, you might outlive it by not by much. So the older you get, so these are death notes essentially. And generation X has been swamped with them. The generation X holds the most in liabilities despite holding fewer assets than the than baby boomers in the silent generation. Um, generation X average $196,000 in home mortgages, consumer credit and other liabilities far outpacing even the millennials. The millennials had uh, Dave Ramsey uh, talking to him for longer than Generation X did. I remember, you know, I don't, I think Dave Ramsey's a Mason to be perfectly honest with you, but when he first came on, you know, I was listening to him, must have been in the 90s or the early, mid 2000s. He was on AM radio and he kept just talking about how bad debt was. And thankfully that was a ministry to me and I received it and got out of debt. And I encourage everybody else that's watching to do the same and not be controlled by debt. So in as much as, Oh, you guys aren't even seeing what I have on the screen. I'm really sorry about that. Put the keynote back up. I wonder if you guys are trying to tell it me, tell me anyway, here's, here's a chart. You're supposed to be seeing a chart for like the last 20 or 30 minutes. Sorry about that. So we can see here that we have, two opposite forces. We have this idea of the boomers who squirreled away all their money and loaded up their storehouses and their barns. That's that, that can, that's bad. According to Jesus, he says not to do that. And then you have on the other side of it, people that go into debt and $200,000 per, per household nearly for generation X. That's horrible. That's, that's as bad as being greedy because you were greedy. You are being greedy because you wanted something that wasn't yours. You coveted for something and you were willing to go into debt to get this thing you coveted and you went about it the wrong way and you weren't willing to take um, the, the, the small baby steps necessary to let God provide for you what you needed and to trust him for what you needed. You trusted a man, you trusted a bank.
Okay, I have this theory I want to tell you guys about. So there's a lot of talk about millennials being super sensitive and they can't take correction. They, they, they don't do well in the working environment. They're wanting to stay home and work. They don't want to go to these corporations. And I, I mean, hey, there could be em embers of truth in that fire. There could be some embers of truth that, that they are sensitive. Uh, millennials have been raised by a lot of divorced families and they've been through the ringer generation X and, and the boomers that birthed millennials did not do a good job parenting them. There is that, but the other, there is that component, but I have to say the other aspect of it is the millennials, I think, and the zoomers that are a little older, I think they see through narc tactics better than the prior generations. They've had more access to information about narcissistic behaviors and they know when they're being talked down to, mistreated, um, dismissed. They know when they're being abused. Not, I'd say they, it sounds like I'm saying the whole population. I'm saying there's a lot of millennials that know that when they go in these corporations that they are being narcissistically abused and they're expected to make slave wages for their whole careers when their CEOs are making a hundred to 5,000 times more than they're making. And they just don't want to put up with it. They don't have the energy for that. And maybe that's a flaw in their character a little bit too. Maybe you could say it is, but I say, you know, they go into a working environment and they're having symptoms of PTSD and they're getting panic attacks and they're like, they're just, they're not willing to do it to, to, to go through that. And I would say that most of these corporations that treat people so narcissistically on a, on a corporate level do so also on the individual level to their employees. And these millennials don't want to put up with that and they're not going to stick around. And so this is another way a divide and conquer routine that everyone talks about, you know, just what wussies and, and how, what terrible work ethic they have and unwillingness to be corrected. And I'm not saying that there isn't some of that going on. There's probably a, a great bit of that going on, but that doesn't negate the fact that a lot of these companies that they go to work for are extremely abusive and don't care at all about the, um, about their employees. Why would they? They're all narcs. They're all narcs. So all right, let's go on now and I'll show you some of the data on what's happened with, with regard to these corporate CEOs and just the billionaire population in general and how the rich are getting richer. This chart shows you how, where most of the billionaires are located. So the U S has 975 billionaires, according to this chart in 2021, 60 of them, 60 live in Canada. Um, there's 34 in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So that's in the Western hemisphere. If you break it out by city, it says there's 138 billionaires in New York, um, which is the most, I think, of any one place. San Francisco has 85. And they still can't afford to go to Walgreens and, and buy a, a, a gallon of milk. Um, Los Angeles has uh, 59, I think it says there. And then you look over in um, London, 77, Paris, 33, Moscow, 73, Istanbul, 33, Dubai, 38, and so on. Hong Kong, 114. China is said to have 400 of them in China. So that's quite a few. But there are currently 3,311 billionaires worldwide. And the 1% billionaires have more money than all the rest of the population combined. So here are some of the staggering CEO to employee pay ratios I was talking of before. Here's some different corporations. Um, Aptive Pick, I've never heard of this company. Their CEO makes uh, 50, nearly 5,300 times what a regular employee makes in their company, 5,300 times. Western Digital, 4,900 times. The Gap CEO makes 3,100 times more. Paycom, 2,900. Chipotle, 2,900. Ross Stores, 20, uh, 2,000 times. Hilton Worldwide, almost 2,000 times. Nike, almost 2,000 times what a standard employee makes. It's unbelievable. So here we have the salaries in the U.S., the average um, salary in 2021. All of them combined was about $58,000 average salary. 
the average S&P 500 CEO pay in 2021 was 18.3 million. So you can see over time since the 70s, the average um, increase was between uh, 14 and nine, 14 and 20 times or 15 and 20 times roughly. And now that's gone to between in 2020, 236 to 398 times on average. CEOs are making that much compensation more than their average employee. So this article was written in July of, of 18th of 2022. The age of greedflation is here. See how the obscene CEO to work or pay ratios are right now. That's one of the articles that I have. Uh, here's another. Why do the rich get richer even during global crisis? Every 30 hours, the pandemic spawned a new billionaire while pushing a million people into poverty every 30 hours. There's another article on how the rich get richer. The rich are getting richer, but low-income Americans are actually getting poorer. The richest 1% bag nearly twice as much wealth as the rest of the world put together over the past two years. The super rich outstripped their extraordinary grab of half of all new wealth in the past decade. Billionaire fortunes are increasing by $2.7 billion a day, even as at least $1.7 billion workers now live in countries where inflation is outpacing wages. So that means the increase in prices for things is not being kept up with by how much money they take home in their, in their paychecks. A tax of up to 5% of the world's multimillionaires and billionaires could raise $1.7 trillion a year. So that article is endorsing um, taxing them. So... You might ask, why is this happening? And I was thinking about that and thinking of the scriptures that talk about the 10 kings um, that are represented in the last days. And you can see in the book of Daniel, it talks about this beast that had 10 horns and the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them. He shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. So it's talking about how the Antichrist rises out of these kings he subdues three of them and of course he takes over the kingdom and good news daniel prophesies that this antichrist shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws they shall be given into his hand until a time and times in the dividing of time so that's the last three and a half years of the tribulation he's uh this the saints aren't able to overcome him some of us will die but others will be protected he's gonna make war on us but when Jesus returns, it says, but the judgment shall sit. They shall take away his dominion, consume and destroy it, and it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. So this is correlating exactly with what Revelation predicts for the end times. So the reason why I'm mentioning these 10 kings is in, in this beast that has seven heads and ten horns is because in also in the book of Revelation in chapter 17 verse 12 it says in the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the beast these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is the lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So when Jesus returns, lands on the Mount of Olive, Olives, fights them at the, at the Valley of Megiddo, they're all going to uh, lose big time. So Daniel and the book of Revelation prophesied that. But I was thinking about those billionaires. I'm thinking about these hidden 10 kings. I don't think we know who they are. I know they present us like the Rothschilds are the the big family, but maybe there are families behind all of these ones that we're told, like the Rothschilds, the Vanderbilts. Um, uh, what's the other? There's so many. There's so many of these families. Obviously, the the so-called British royalty, the Queen of Holland, and there's all these people that are mentioned as part of the family lines. And you can study the Rockefellers. You could study all of that more deeply on your own, but. I say that to say that Satan has his minions, his earthly minions who sell their souls to him and they are given the kingdoms of this world just as Jesus was offered in the desert after his 40 days of fasting. He said, I'll give you all the kings of the world if you only bow and worship me. Well, Jesus didn't question whether or not Satan could make that offer and fulfill it. That was not in question. 
he was able to make that offer and he has given the kingdoms and the wealth of this world, which we turned over to him in the garden of Eden when we um, agreed with him to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we made him little G God of this world. And so people that don't come out of agreement with Satan can serve Satan and he will pay them off. In the end, he's going to betray all of them. All of them will be betrayed and um, he will not help any one of them. And he would like to see all of them, what those that serve him die. He hates them as much as he hates us. It's all a, it's all 100% um, deception on Satan's part to make them think that they're blessed of him and all that. But he offers them material things of this world. And when they give into that and they sell their souls and they, they do things contrary to their conscience and to what is right to get that money and they keep upping the ante and perhaps sacrificing animals and sacrificing people and all the different eyes wide shut. That's a movie reference stuff that, that people do in stages where they go deeper and deeper signing their name and blood type stuff. And they get more and more wealth. The further they go, the more wealth they could, they could potentially have access to. Although it could be taken away at any moment. You know, it's a precarious situation that they're in serving Satan and they're going to go to the lake of fire, the burns with brimstone forever for doing so. If they don't repent, I mean, perhaps some of them are past repentance. I mean, maybe they're reprobate. I don't know, but I, I, I can't say that. I can't say one way or the other, but all I know is there are so many people that maybe have not gone that far that have didn't listen to Jesus, didn't lose their lives to save them, that served money put money in a position where if they didn't have it, they weren't going to be satisfied with their lives and they put money on a pedestal. And Jesus, as we read before, said you cannot serve God and mammon. And those of us that equate our wealth with his favor are way far off the reservation as it were. And... it's totally necessary to come to a different place in your heart about that and also be ready to walk into a world where money is going to be less available to you the more unwilling you are to do things the world's way. And you're going to have to trust the Father to give you your provision at His will when He wills it because He knows what you have need of and that He will provide it and stop worrying about it. Like Jesus said, and put all your trust in the Father. And if you'll do that, you'll have peace. But if you feel like you have to run some corporate hamster wheel every day to get at wealth so that you can be safe in, in money, which as I've shown you throughout this episode, if you, were, if you weren't here with us, I showed you the value of the dollar now versus 1920. In 2022, the value of one dollar, let's say it was one dollar, it would have been twenty six dollars in 1920, hundred years prior. And so the dollar has just rapidly lost value. There are things on the horizon that could cause it to lose even more value, or it takes many more dollars to buy everyday items, milk and eggs and and chicken and, and vegetables and the like. And if that happens. And it, and it goes out of control and takes a full day's work to get a loaf of bread. Are you going to freak out? Or are you going to trust the father? You know, one thing that's interesting, I was thinking about this too. Let me pull this scripture up. It has to do with the Sabbath and how I think it was during the time of Nehemiah. Let me make sure I find this. Yeah. During the time of Nehemiah, um, it was on the Sabbath day, and it says in verse um, 31 of chapter 10 of the book of Nehemiah, and if the people of the land bring where or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day. So he's saying, when you're going to respect the Sabbath so much, we're not going to buy and sell on the Sabbath. I personally try never to do so. And I think that having that one day a week where you preclude yourself from doing so gives you a little bit of a reset where you already are getting used to this idea of God's provision without you buying or selling. And of course, if you're pretty lean and you don't have a lot of money, 
and you're only buying, you know, certain staple items at the, at the grocery store every now and then you're not like living a consumer lifestyle as I think a lot of us are going to, ha are, are having to do already, as we already showed by some of the data I showed that people aren't able to save money anymore. So they're spending all their money on what they're, uh, on, on staple on everyday items. And you kind of get used to that. Then you're, then you're, then you're going to, you're going to be more ready and just pray and ask the father to lead you. If he wants you to do anything like grow a garden, I noticed I saw an article from China the, uh, just maybe yesterday that showed that they are going and sending, they, they hired a bunch of military or police, farm police to go shut down gardens. That's what they did in Russia before uh, Vladimir Lenin killed all those people. Or was it Stalin? It was one of the two. They took away the farmer's rights to grow any food. And they definitely would like to do that, I think, to us. But if you're just prayerful about your provision and what God wants, how God wants to provide for you and seek that out and get used to hearing from him in that regard, he will start showing you some different ways he's, he might be doing some things in your life. And practice now for what's going to come because when you can't buy or sell without the mark and you've already kind of practiced a little, it's going to be a lot easier for you than some sudden switch. There's going to be a lot of people that remain high level consumers right up until that point and they're believers, right? And they're not used to doing any of this stuff already. And they've given money too much of an importance until that point that it's going to be hard for them to say no to the mark of the beast when they can't buy or sell without it. And again, they already shot their salvo over our bow with trying to force us to take, you know what, and telling us that we can't, certain companies wouldn't allow you to go come to work, schools, even universities to this day are saying, if you're not, if you haven't taken the, you know what, you can't come to the school. So we got to get used to stepping away and receiving God's blessing from him in his own way. I think this generation will see, will see this. We, I think we will see this, you know, I'm noticing a lot of people dying lately. It's probably because of my age. A lot of people, my parents age and my aunt and people, people are, I don't know. I'm just noticing that. A lot of people that took the you know what too that perhaps died younger than they might have. I'm smiling because I said that and then I just don't care anymore. You know, they can I don't I don't know. There's a lot of people talking this way on YouTube now. They've given us a little more flexibility talking about this this bogus thing that went on. But all the people that were called the tinfoil hatters at the beginning were all right. Every single one of them was right about what happened right from the beginning. The ones that were telling the truth about it, you know, it was ridiculous. All right. Well, let me see a few commenters. David says, hi, Gary's here. Donna's here. Turo Bez says, summary covetousness and mammon worship. Yup. Carl says, I'm one of the older generation X people. I don't see how a Christian can be a porn star of any kind. Great of that film. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. But there's so many witches that just say that. They're just told to say that they're 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 Christians. Let's see. Rach says, I just found my student loan signature page from decades ago. It's only ever increased in over 8% interest for decades. Wow. Yeah, man, the student loan too. That's the millennials or the ones that are, a lot of the millennials decided not to go. But those that did have more debt from school loans than any other generation. And the Zoomers are jumping into that right now. And uh, now that everybody knows it, these so-called universities of higher learning are just brainwashing centers. Many people have left those and have decided to try to just learn how to do regular jobs for provision or maybe go learn how to weld or be a diesel mechanic. You know, out here in the country, that's what they do. And they 
a lot of those guys break six figures within a few years. All right, guys. Well, just in summary, generational economic divide and conquer. Don't resent the boomers. And boomers, don't you resent the younger people. The younger people are really taking it on the chin. They don't have a chance. And a lot of, a lot of boomers and Generation Xers that have children, you know that to be true. And even if they do go to college, if they don't get some kind of scholarship, it's 50, 60 grand a year only to come out and not even be able to, you know, even people with average grades when I graduated in 1992 could get a decent job out of college. But that's, that's changed for many people unless you go to some super quote elite school and you're in the buddy buddy system and you can get some job because you went to the elite school, but it's become tougher and tougher. And, uh, couldn't in conclusion, the inflation that's here, the Bible prophesied it. Don't worry. Don't let that worry you. God will protect you. Keep trusting in him, serving him, walking out your days with him. Let him lead and guide you and, and keep his commandments. And you can be part of the oil and the wine that he says not to hurt. All right, guys, I'm going to conclude in prayer. Father God, I praise you and thank you for this time to talk about these matters. I pray that everyone that listens will leave it not discouraged, but encouraged that you can be trusted way more than the world's systems of economics, that your economic system, your kingdom's economic system is where our provision comes from. And I thank you for teaching us that and for helping us to see that you are our provider and that whatever we need, you will provide it. And whatever situation we're supposed to be in, you will provide for those situations that we should be in. And I praise you and thank you for that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. If you like any of the music you hear on the channel, you download free of charge, the Reverb Nation link below. Also, the YouTube playlist. You can see the videos and listen to the songs anytime you want on that playlist. You know, the playlist is really cool because you could do shuffle where you can listen to random songs in a, or random videos in a playlist or um, listen to them in order. You can even cause it to loop. I mean... You know, for all Google's uh, foibles and their, the evil that they've done, one thing they made is an amazing interface. So I, I give them credit for that, I guess. But um, also check out our backup channels. They're all listed below. We're on Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey. Um, usually they'll automatically populate any video I make on YouTube. So I'm not exactly going there and posting there first, but this video should automatically populate on those um, various links. So go subscribe there in case anything happens to the YouTube channel. And also, if you'd like to help out the, the ministry and donate, you could do so. The PayPal link below. Everything we do is free of charge. So, um, but donations are what keep us going. So we appreciate all those that are helping. Donna asks if I'm on Spotify. And no, I'm not. And I've prayed about doing that. And I just don't feel led to. But um, I don't know why I don't feel led to do that. But I did set up a... a account that would automatically populate Spotify, Amazon music and all these others. And I just, something told me just to hold back and just to self publish and let people find it that way. Maybe the father had some reason. Um, but also, um, what was I going to say? If you need prayer, you can write me at without spot at gmail.com and I can um, write you an email prayer. Or if you want to set up an over the zoom or Skype or phone prayer, we could do that. So without spot at gmail.com. Also, if you're not into using PayPal and want to donate, you could send it to PO box 53 Garfield, Georgia 30425. All right, guys. It's so good to see Toro Bez. Good to see you, Gary, Donna, simply me, David, simply me. Glad you made it. Um, Donna, Dr. Spengler, man. Good to see you. There are many that still believe the scam was real. Yeah. I guess you're right. I'm just not around very many people like that, but I live in a more conservative area. So, and, um, I, I, I know you're right. I know they're still drinking the Kool-Aid. You're right. I'm just not around a lot, a lot of those people. My homies are all like just memeing out all over it. So, um, Gary, all you guys, it's so good to see you. We'll see you on the next broadcast or without spotted blemish ministry. I'll send you out in the closeout room. See you next time.
Thank you so much for joining us for another live stream podcast. Just wanted to use this time to tell you about our other channels and websites. You'll find links below for our music backup channel, for our brand new Jesus Not Paul channel, as well as for our blog and our website, as well as the website for JesusNotPaul.org. Hope you'll check it out. There's free materials you can find on those websites, especially JesusNotPaul.org. Everything we provide is free of charge, but we also have a PayPal link below for donations for those who feel led. And we really appreciate your support to help us continue to making content that's helping people find the truth and to find Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Thanks so much for your support and enjoy the podcast.